Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for choosing our session, Life Events When Life Gets It in the Way, What to Do with Personal Disruption. My name is Shalini Matani. I am co-founder of the Zubin Foundation, a social policy think tank and charity working with some of the most marginalized in Hong Kong. The name Zubin means to serve and honor, and it is um, because my son Zubin passed away that I set up the foundation. So today's session starts with personal disruption with the moderator, but today's session is not about me, it's just I can understand some of it. Um, and it's really about the fabulous speakers I have on my panel, and it is a great privilege for me to have all four of these fabulous women. Before I start the session, I have been informed to let you know about the social media conversation and to share your Women of Influence experience, hashtag AmCham H-K-W-O-I, or tag AmCham H-K. I hope you understand what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is ask each speaker to speak for no more than three to five minutes. I'd like them to talk with you about their life and their disruptions. And after that, we will open, well, we will not open the floor to Q&A just yet. We will have a discussion on this stage between us first, and then we will open the floor to Q&A. What I love about this particular conference is the authenticity. I um, have been conferenced out, having worked on women leaders and research and many things during my professional life. And I would really encourage you to ask those questions that you can't perhaps ask others because these wonderful women are opening themselves to you and being vulnerable. So on the panel with me, we have Patricia Ho first. Um, you have all their bios, so I shan't read them, and nor shall I read their official titles. They're all extremely impressive. For me, Patricia is a Hong Kong girl. She went to local schools. She went to university abroad. She's a human rights lawyer, which tells you a little bit about her already. She's a partner with a human rights law firm. She's married with two kids, and her husband is a Christian pastor. Now, I will now leave it to Patricia to tell her story of her disruptions. Thank you. Um, I feel intimidated by my introduction. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so I woke up this morning thinking, perfect. I just had a night of intense disruptions setting me up well for today. That included me going to bed early, thinking I'm going to get myself ready. But throughout the night, my son kept whining and hovering right next to me going, Mummy, <laughs> Mummy, I'm so scared. <laughs> um, so that was that. Um, yeah, anyways, so um, I, I think I'm quite conscious. I'm, you know, one of the youngest members of this panel. Um, I'm 33. I sometimes look younger, so I'd just like to set that straight. Um, I, you know, I'm very, very aware that I have, you know, so little life experience compared to many others on the panel. Um, but at the same time, you know, I just wanted to share about how I suppose I, I've been a person who really always looked for disruptions in my life, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and I um, think that in many ways, I keep on questioning about my purpose in life by looking for significance of disruptions. So, you know, just quickly back to m my own journey a bit. So I'm the eldest of four children. Um, my dad actually passed away two years ago. Um, he passed away when he was 83. So I had a very old father, very wise man. Um, and my mother is 26 years younger than him. She's Chinese. Did I mention my dad? So my dad's a very, very traditional British. My mom's very Chinese and, and actually speaks with the Chinglish accent. Actually, she didn't speak English before she met my dad. Anyway, so... I had a very strange family, um, and lots of arguments throughout. You know, my dad married my mom when you know she was demure and didn't speak much English. And then, as she spoke more English, he's like, "Whoa, who did I marry?" Um, 
and and you know she's like a super vocal opinionated woman and he's like the I'm old and I'm wise and I can look past this man yeah. um, so you know with that it, it was interesting and it, but everything you know I was told that I, I like to argue with my mom throughout my life she was always unreasonable as many Chinese mothers are um, and she was always you know telling me what to do and all of that and I would always argue with her my dad looked at me and went you'd be a wonderful lawyer since I was about five I ended up um, studying law but while I was there I was already desperate to look for some meaning in that you know everybody in law um, was looking for the wonderful contract with big firms um, they would be looking for um, security you know somebody to sponsor their qualifications and all of that and I was actually standing there going oh my gosh I'm I'm so scared I can't imagine going through this conveyor belt of you know going to the big firm and and seeing whether I would succeed in that or not and you know and and, and along that goes right so I was actually there asking questions of um, what is the significance of my life and you know how how can I do something that helped people and then I just started um, noticing all the chaos around me um, children or, or children I knew growing up who were um, having a lot of drugs. I remember there was this one story I heard of a friend I knew who was um, performing a sex act at school. Um, and I, I was so heartbroken and I was thinking, how can I you know, go back and be a good role model to that person? Um, so, you know, all of those things made me question, how am I going to be a role model? And I basically just had to figure out what my passions were, which was that I had this vicious desire to see things set right. I like to see things, um, um, you know, if there's any injustice or anybody's being bullied, I like to set that right. And so all these things came together, you know, law, my passion, and um, um, wanting to have a good impact on others. And so, yeah, you know, I got into human rights law, and, you know, I suppose that kind of kind of kept going, and, um, um, you know, I guess the other, I know I've got probably no time left, but the principal disruptor in me being a human rights lawyer in the last 10 years is seeing my friends and family get worried about me because they would have wonderful cocktails um, and collect enough money to start um, paying for their mortgage. Um, and my mom would start worrying about whether I would support myself or not. And all of these voices around me about how I need to be stable and actually you know support my children be a good wife and all of that um, I just had to keep sticking to my belief from the beginning why I wanted to come to do this work in the first place and I had to fight through all of that all the way through um, and you know in many ways I'm so glad I did um, because that continues to be something that confirms my desire that this is the right way to go. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, it's all over the place, but I'll try I, to I, make I wanted, that make sense. I wanted to add a couple more things to Pat. Okay. Um, I think what was very interesting when I heard Patricia's story was that this internal struggle between I love the law and I love helping people, but on the flip side, am I being selfish? Um, because I love this so much, but on the flip side, my husband's a pastor, and I'm the the the, the main family breadwinner. And how do I marry that? Do you marry that, or do you live with the notion that okay, I'm just going to be selfish and do what I want? But I'm now putting words in your mouth. But you told me that, so um, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Liani, so how I know Liani, our children were at school together, a Chinese school, which was a little bit crazy, actually. But um, we won't talk about that. So again, her bio's in the pack. Um, Liani is one of the only electrical engineers that I know from our generation. So, you know, for that in itself, she deserves a round of applause. Um, <laughs> But she, she moved from engineering to marketing and strategy, and I've asked the question, why? Um, 
she is director of marketing at Emerson's. Mm. She is also a Hong Kong girl, which is interesting. And I know we often don't have that on panels. So I quite like that we have a panel of Hong Kong women. Actually, all of us are Hong Kong women, how I define Hong Kong women. And, um, and so she went to German Swiss International School. And she is married with two kids. And please tell your disruption. So the notion of disruption is important because how we view disruption differs for each of us. Tara, at the beginning of today, said it was, when she read up the definition of disruption, it was something that was rough and kind of not welcoming. Is it, is it the death of a child? Is that disruption? Absolutely. But what is it? Is it disruption if you feel it's disruption? For example, in Patricia's case, where you know, she chose a different career path. And at every point along the way, she feels that she's got this nagging question. You'll hear from Leanne. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. So, um, yeah, so thank you for the kind introduction, Shalini. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I will jump straight to kind of that engineering life because, um, I, um, you know, going back to why I chose, why I chose such a, you know, male-dominated um, degree was maybe the start of, of, of me wanting to be different from everyone else. I think a lot of us, you know, are a bit like that, right? And so um, I remember, I mean, it wasn't that, wow, I thought engineers were like the coolest profession at all. <laughs> it was actually more like, oh, I was really good in, in, in science and math and um, more so than, you know, the other maybe history type of, of, of subject. So I, I wanted to pick something that utilizes a lot of that. And so I, that's how I went into engineering. And um, <clears throat> a little bit about my career path is that, yeah, like as, as I studied engineering, did a lot of lab work, you know, like <laughs> um, research and all that, it was very um, non-customer facing, right? It was all in the labs. And, and I started to explore what I like to do and I, I was more of a people person, and then that really defines my the change or the track of my career. From, I mean, I, I remember when I was in university, I was a programmer, you know, for summer schools and stuff. But heading, and then I, I got into consulting, and then now I'm in Emerson, which is still an engineering manufacturing company, but definitely more in the business and the marketing side. Um, so that that is kind of how my career took took off. Um, well, in parallel, um, I guess, you know, for me, the way I define the disruption today is is really being this working mom. I think that's kind of the hardest or th what I'm facing as a challenge at the moment. So in parallel, right, as, as I, you know, got married and had children and, you know, there was a phase where I actually... Uh, resign from from working and I and I wanted to just devote my time with my children and I stayed home and you know all that but then I realized so I, I knew what it was like to to be home with the children to be there and see them every day and know exactly what's going on at school be really engaged you know with what's happening with the other moms and the schools and then I realized um that 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 what I wasn't I didn't feel like it was enough for me and so I decided to go back to work uh, after staying home for three years. And then I, I went back to Emerson. So I left Emerson and went back to Emerson. And um, while I was, while I started in Emerson back in 2013, I think I got promoted like three times in the next three or four years. So um, that has been such a disruption, but it's a good disruption, but of course it comes with sacrifices, right? Because I felt like, you know, as I got, <laughs> higher resp more responsibilities to do more things. I was traveling, I was having a regional role. I, I just had to learn. I mean, I went from a stay-at-home mom, you know, I knew everything and then I was doing everything myself. So I had to learn how to, how to delegate, how to, you know, gain support network and how to, actually my biggest peer pressure are the other moms <laughs> because like they know so much and I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know anything. <laughs> so yeah, so I think I have to learn how to deal with that. So, yeah, and my dad, yeah, my dad, um, he lives with us, so he lives at home, and, and he's been such an inspiration, and he's been my strong support network. So he's at home helping me, you know, um, get the kids to activities to another, and, um, you know, 
looking after their Chinese homework. And so, yeah, so yeah, I think uh, just kind of building that support network, you know, with my dad, um, with the tutors, right? And like my husband as well, I think, you know, part of me, especially, you know, since with the engineering industry, right, like it's so male dominated that I think it gives me a stronger meaning. Like I wanna change the statistics, right? I'm trying to promote more girls to be interested in STEM, you know, to, to not be afraid of, um, of engineering and math and all that. Um, and at the same time, changing the, the you know, the level playing field. But, um, and I felt like, you know, one of the benefit of doing that is that my husband gets to, I want him to be able to share the pa parenting load as well. Because I, again, like in the old days, right, the, 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 the wife does a lot of the kids' does he, activities. Does he share the parenting load? Yeah, because actually right now he's seeing our t um, my daughter's teachers for a parent-teacher conference. So I, I was, uh, I mean, I've never skipped a parent-teacher conference. <laughs> so today I'm like, hey, I have to be talking to this, can, talking at this conference. Can you be see the, the teacher? And he's like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. So, I, I mean, I thought that was, wow. Like, I was actually quite nervous that he wasn't going to know what, what to say. But he, I think He probably I want, I, won't, <laughs> with all due respect. But I, I, I mean, I think this is kind of the outcome of being a working mother, to, to be able to have more equal share of, of parenting roles. Thank you, Leah. Yeah. Um, I'd now like to move on to, um, for me, Auntie Phyllis, but for you, Phyllis Marwa. And she is the co-founder of Mother's Choice. Um, I should probably disclaim that um, I am not, I am biased towards Mother's Choice. My third child spent the first seven months of his life there. So I am um, eternally uh, grateful to Phyllis for setting up this organization that looked after my baby. Um, so why is she on the panel? She is also a Hong Kong girl. She is more wise than all of us put together on this panel, in my personal opinion. Um, she came to Hong Kong over 30 years ago as an American, co-founded this orphanage and a home for unmarried mothers. She has six children. She has made Hong Kong home, and she has the great benefit of wisdom and hindsight. So, uh, Auntie Phyllis, please share your story. Oh, thank you. This is going to be a surprise to you because I've had a big disruption in the last three weeks. Um, I woke up three weeks ago with a really strong pain uh, in my hip. And it was about 12.30 at night when I realized that I was not going to get any sleep and that this pain was getting worse. So I didn't wake anybody up. I got in the car and I drove to the Adventist hospital. And I said went into the emergency room, and I said, give me drugs. I want <laughs> drugs. <laughs> and they said, okay, you can have the drugs, but we have to do a few other things as well. So this is a big disruption for me because they did scans on my, on my abdomen, and they came back and they said, we have good news and we have bad news. I said, okay, it's my appendix. They said, no, it's not your appendix. I've got kidney stones, because those are the two things that I thought I had. And they said, no, uh, all of your organs are fine, but you've got a bunch of spots on your spine, and you must have serious cancer. And this is a sign that it's metastasized. <laughs> got to learn how to say that word. And so we've got to start doing all kinds of tests. So I didn't call my children until the next day, and I started going through all the tests, which really wreck you up, by the way, and still unsolved problems for a week. I went through every test you can, no sign of cancer, except that I have these spots on my spine. So when they talked about bone cancer and doing um, uh, a biopsy of my bone, I said, I'm checking out of hospital. So... That brought me back to maybe 20 years ago when I was with my husband in a, in a couple's retreat. And the guy who was leading the retreat said, uh, your homework for tonight is to go home and write a letter. If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, I want you to write a letter and get your life in order. So, of course, nobody did it. 
And we were meeting the other couples at breakfast the next morning, and they said, uh, who's done it? And I decided that I was going to do it. So I went off in the corner, and I wrote about five pages just off the top of my head, unemotional. I wasn't in the position I was in a few weeks ago, and I wrote this letter. And so we went into our session, and the guy said, who has done the homework? <laughs> so anyway, uh, so uh, the moderator called on me, and he said, well, you're the only one that's done it. I want you to read it. So I said, no problem. I go up, and I start reading, and I read the words, my darling children. And I couldn't continue reading. I just broke up. It just broke my heart. Just those words broke my heart. And so the moderator said, OK, just take your time. Just take your time. So I re read the first next few lines. And I couldn't continue. And he said, take your time. And I looked up, and everybody in the room was bawling. And I managed to read through the whole thing. Uh, I, I have given, whenever I've been through a really big disruption, I usually write letters, and I give them to my oldest daughter, Alia. And I say, don't read these. Someday, my, um, my culture as a mom, this will come out, what I think. So I want you to keep these letters. And I've written about five of them. Uh, so I'm 70 years old. You know, I've been through a lot of disruptions. <laughs> and um, uh, these are, so I told her last night, I want you to retrieve that letter so I can tell people what I said. And she said, no. <laughs> This is, this is for us. So she didn't bring it to me, but I was thinking last night, what did I write? And the first thing that I wrote was uh, actually my value system. Uh, my father, who always said, do what is right, and he always worked for the poor. That was my value system that I've grown up with. But he, doesn't, he didn't teach me other things. He didn't teach me what to do when bad things happen. Or... Taking care of others doesn't mean that you don't take care of yourself. You, you come first, too. You're important, too. Uh, he, I have learned along the way that nobody taught me is that hope does not, is not like pie in the sky. Hope is a decision. The way I live my life is a decision. And uh, I had my first six children in seven years. And I learned pretty early on. You can imagine breastfeeding and being pregnant for nine years. And I learned a long time ago that how I live my life is going to be a choice that I have. So it's going to be a decision. So I said, with my children, all these children that all have different needs and wake me up all night, I was going to be patient, kind, and loving. And also to my husband. I said, I will always be, it's like written on my forehead, I will be patient, kind, and loving. I was reading a book yesterday on, it says, love kindness. And it said, kindness is not being nice. Because nice doesn't have to be genuine. Being kind is authenticity. And so I, that was a great reminder to me. Uh, so... I, I think these values have really gone with me through my life, that also uh, hope is not, um, it, it's not, like I said, it's not pie in the sky. It's a choice that we make. So throughout the disruptions, and I've had many in my life, I've decided that, number one, I would have hope. And hope means that you don't have answers right away, but you have the vision to see beyond what's happening to you at the moment. And I always told myself, I never have to live today again. This day has been bad, but it's over with, and I don't have to live it again. And so uh, going back to three weeks ago, uh, I actually was quite at peace. Because I said, you know, I, I wrote to my kids, um, that I love them very much. This is what I remember. I wrote to my kids that they needed to always get along and respect each other. Because I said, if you as, as children can get along and solve your problems and say sorry, and, and if, you, if you can manage yourselves, you can deal with the world. Because you learn the world through your own family. And I think I ended with telling my kids that my faith is, has <laughs> what has gotten me through 
all these bad things. I was uh, speaking at a conference at Hong Kong U, um, and it, all the students, there were about 500 of them, of them, asked four questions, which I had to answer. I was one on a panel as well. And one was, um, why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? And I said, you know, who do we think we are? Good things happen to everybody. Bad things happen to everybody. And we can't put ourselves in the position to say, oh, I'm the only one that's suffering because it, it falls on good and bad alike. And so I think the, the idea of hope the idea of second chances. When I make a mistake, I always say, it's okay. It's okay I made a mistake. I won't do it again. <laughs> you know, uh, watching what my own values are has really gotten me through life. Um, just in that, there was a lot of wisdom. I wonder, um, so I'm sorry about the white spots, and I oh, hope we okay. figure out what That's, that is. That story is not finished, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to be fine. Um, I wonder if you would share, as you did when we met for lunch, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can do this in a nutshell, by the way, yeah. the six quick disruptions of your life. Because I think it's really important, and I have learned this through telling my story, that when my best friends have a crap day, they kind of th think about me. <laughs> and they think, actually, we've had a great day because my life is crap. And if I have provided that comfort to other people to look at their life a little bit in respect, you know, relative, then that's okay for me. So there is a lot of shit that happens to a lot of people. And so much of what we talk about as professional women, as professionals, is we have this facade that it's all about the transaction at work. And, you know, we are great at our work. And actually, we hear about that a lot. But what we don't hear is about the crap that takes place in our head. And so I wonder, Auntie Phyllis, if you don't want to, that's fine. Let's see. No, I'm happy to do it. Oh, you five or six. Um, okay. And I think that'll just make people walk out of here thinking, oh, I've had, I've got a great life. <laughs> and, and you know what? It's really important. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, how do I explain it in a few sentences? I think the first one was coming to Hong Kong thinking that I was going to be here for three days. And it turned out uh, that I've been here for 45 years. And coming from a small town uh, where actually white people were the minority, so I never thought of myself as white, uh, realizing that I was still in a minority. <laughs> I came, got married very quickly, had kids really quickly, and had and no family around me. So, um, so you know that was that was hard. Um, my dad died right when I was expecting my first baby, Alia, two days before, and I couldn't go to the funeral. Uh, I had to go through that alone because nobody knew my background and I didn't have very many friends. I would say, um, I don't remember all of them, but I would say I was married for 38 and a half years and uh, then had to get a divorce. And that was probably pretty difficult for me to work through. Um, uh, talk about fear being my enemy. I was very fearful for a really long time and trying to work through that. Uh, I had the death of my youngest son, uh, who died very tragically, I think. And uh, how I got through that was uh, we all, he died in Laos. He was 22 years old. And I remember all of the family, whoever could get their passports, met at the airport. And Alia was the first person that I saw. And she took me by the shoulders. And she said, Mom, you can handle this, can't you? And I stood up straight. I'd been screaming all the way in the taxi. <laughs> and um, I stood up straight and I said, yes. And she said, you're going to have to make a lot of decisions. You can make them, can't you, Mom? And I stood up strong, and I said, yes. And she said, then we're going to do this all together, aren't we? And I said, yes. And that really got me through that. Um, I think that's quite a lot, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, any, <laughs> any other reminders? I can think of a whole lot of them. Uh, my second daughter as a child had childhood seizures. And I don't know if you've ever seen one of your kids have a seizure, but that was pretty uh, intense for me because you always think that when you have your children that they're going to be perfect and to find out that something might really be wrong with them. Uh, and I, I have to say through all of this, even though many times I felt all alone, always looking back, there were people to help me. Always. Your relationships garner them and feed them and take the time for them because they're what's going to get you through. Can Thank you remind you. me of any others? No, I think that's... that's uh, well, funny. actually, I can remind you of a lot, but that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you. Fermi, I'd like to go to you. So Fermi is uh, an amazing woman. And actually, as the Hong Kong community, we have a massive amount to that we owe Fermi. She is the founder of Unison, the first not-for-profit organization in Hong Kong that fought for the rights of the non-Chinese population. And if it wasn't for Fermi, this would not be a policy issue at all. It would not be on the radar of the Hong Kong government. So I personally am, am deeply indebted to you. Um, Fermi's journey has been an extraordinary one um, from mainland China to Hong Kong for fighting for people who look nothing like her um, and for actually being resented by the majority population for helping brown people. Um, a few years ago, Fermi left Unison, um, having founded it, and she started a new, complicated as well, journey in her life. She has also written a book about her life, which um, I know is in Chinese, but I know she's also having translated, and I can't wait to read that. But Fermi, why don't you tell us about your disruptions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, of course, you know, uh, now I'm going to few years later, I will be, you know, 50 years old, right? So a lot of uh, life um, uh, disruptions. But I would like to share, you know, a uh, uh, few among, you know, uh, many that I know is uh, important for me. The first one uh, was that, you know, I, I, I was born in China. And the first one was, you know, uh, immigrate to Hong Kong. That I believe that you will agree that migration is a process of this organization and reorganization, right? So I, because I brought up all my network or everything in China, that I was 11 years old, and I, do, I did not speak any word of Cantonese. Of course, no English, even ABC. I never heard of it in China. So um, first of all, of course, you know, I faced uh, language barriers. And also because of the poverty, we lived in a wooden house, temporary wooden housing area in Diamond Hill. There, uh, of course, the environment was very nasty. That you always will see mouses, cockroach, all those you know, little friends, right? Okay, so um, um, what I what I saw in uh, the area was that um, people were very struggling, very hardworking too, because you know, all, almost all people working very long hours in Simple Kong, Simple Kong's factories, and my parents, also my mom has to, had to work two jobs. Because my father is mentally challenged, the mild way of intelligence challenged, and we have a five children, right? Um, my, my parents have five children. Among five of us, three of um, children also are intelligence challenged. That means, only me and my second elder sister are normal. Okay, so we, from when I was very young, we have to, you know, to look after of my whole families. Okay, that of course, I, in my teenagers, I was keep asking that, you know, why, you know, what problem, what's wrong with my, my family, and also because you know, um, my family is rather special that we convert into Christian in China. That was very special because only very few people there, I mean, there to, right, to have a faith in uh, Christians. Of course, I, at the time, I did not believe in God because in my view that God does not love us. My family, at least, in not really just takes. Maybe he loves other people, but not mine, right? Not my, my family. Okay, that was my first um, disruption that, you know, I was 
rather unhappy in Hong Kong that in terms of, you know, in, in school or in my living area, because quite a lot of discrimination. And at the time, not many social services that will accommodate to the need of new arrivals, right? Okay. And, but, you know, um, when I was in Form 5, that year was 1989 that, you know, uh, really enlightened and changed my life that, you know, because I, I, I think you will know that there was an important event happened in China, right? Okay, it's the June 4 instance. And I was not so care about it, but one day, because I, I watched a TV that, you know, uh, they have the people wanted this, right? And the, uh, the, the first one was Wang Dan, the, uh, one of the student leaders that, you know, and then um, uh, from the TV, it says that it's a 24 years old uh, student leader, and so now it's wanted, right, by the um, uh, uh, China government. And then uh, my friends told me that, no, he's not 24 years old, he's only 19 years old. And then it shocked me, because at that year, I was 19 years old too. And then I just start to think, oh, someone in their 19 years old we sacrifice their life, right? Freedom, that to certain cause. China's democracy or, you know, um, uh, uh, civilization, human rights. And what I'm doing, I was, you know, I tell you, you know, every day going outside, hanging around with my friends, smoking, sitting on the park, skip from the schools, and even <laughs> not prepare for the HKCE. <laughs> I went to campaign, okay. And I really, you know, start to think, what kind of people I want to be? Really, you know, it's really, I, I want, I, at the time, I always, you know, viewed that life is so meaningless because of my family, you know, um, uh, difficulties that, you know, there is no point that, you know, to live if you are mentally challenged or, uh, you know, other, you know, difficulty, disabilities. So, but because of that instant, and then I start to feel maybe I can manage a rather meaningful life and then I, I start to have my dream, my vision that I want to be a social worker. But social work, I, 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 I knew nothing about social work. Huh? I just know that, you know, you can just keep talking and then get paid. So because I love talking. And then I said, oh, there is a job that, you know, you just talk and then people pay you. So, you know, so what a wonderful job. So I, I and then I, okay, I decided I want to be a social worker. Okay. And then I was, um, I, I would change social worker. And in 98, you know, I, I encountered uh, a group of, you know, um, Nepalese and Pakistani kids. They were only 9 to 15 years old. They, um, uh, they, are not, not, they were not going to schools. And of course, it really aroused my attention that why? Because we have a nine years compulsory education. How dare you don't go to school, right? I can sue you. Okay. So, and, and that, you know, and I start my career that with uh, working with FMI artists. It's from a group of kids that they could not find school to go. And then I start advocacy to have uh, equal opportunities in education for FMI artists children, especially those from the South Asian origins and working class. So this is how I start. And I start to working with them, but because uh, I think back to 98, um, there was no NGO was serving African Maltese. I think one or two served domestic helpers a little bit, but I mean, you know, serving the local African Maltese Westerns, no. And then I start to serve to find school for the kids, but of course I feel, you know, very, very hot and hit oppositions from my colleagues. I think at the time, I mean, people are more um, conservative, not really know about South Asians. And then they suggest to me that we are Chinese, we should serve the Chinese first. And then if you still have time and energy, you serve the new arrivals from China. And if you still have energy, okay, and then you can serve other ethnic groups. But they, I don't buy the idea because, you know, as a social worker, our core value is, uh, we really believe in human rights and social justice. And the services, because you know, resources are always limited. And then we have to base on need, right? Need base, not on ethnicity. It's who is more needy. 
in office lay, right? At the time, I will see the kids from South Asians that, you know, they, they are uh, in more need because, you know, education is so fundamental. And, so and what I want to say here is yeah. Fermi not only received discrimination from, from uh, other social workers, but also the government was not keen yeah. that this was an issue to look at. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you say, of course, you know, I start to advocate and, of course, face a lot of you know criticize or especially the government. Uh, yeah, it's so nasty. I would say, and sometimes so frustrating, because you know they, because you know whenever I see any government officials, I will, you know, tell their stories, right? And they they will just some of them just laugh at me, intentionally. They want me to feel, you know, uh, what I'm doing is something no good at all or uh, worth to be laughed. That like, uh, you are not FMRTs, why you are so care about it? Is it because you want to have a boyfriend uh, with a you know, Pakistani origin or what? Or, and also say, um, because you know, I face another language barrier, okay. When I just came to Hong Kong, I did not speak Cantonese. And when I start work with FMRTs, I did not speak any English, because you know, my education is more or less in Chinese because of the local right um, context. Okay, so I start to you know speak English and people will laugh. Hey, I don't understand what you are saying. And oh, your English is so poor. How can you really representing every artist? I say okay. Well, uh, you see, for communication only, right? So it's only fifty percent for language. In other seventy percent is my passion. Okay, and body language. So you understand me? Okay. So I start to advocate, but it's of course it's really really hard. And what I have to 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 um, tell myself is, okay, I just, you know, see every each day is a new day. Just if it's my first day to advocate, you know, my first day to tell the story. Otherwise, you know, you cannot keep going. Okay, so that is, you know, what I, what, yeah, what I do. And then um, after many years, and then um, uh, I found, you know, uh, Unison equivalent to Femi Wong, and then that is no good. And then I want to, my organization have a, uh, more healthy development, and then I choose to step down and uh, to let you know, other people you know, to continue my mission. But unfortunately, after I step down, I find myself have some healthy issue, is it depression and breast cancer. So now I have another journey is you know, to fight for you know, uh, my health. And of course, you know, now I'm quite happy to speak for the mental health person. And then now I'm start to lobby the government to a better policy for their mental health. Okay, so this is my brief story. Thank you. Um, could you help join me and give them a round of applause? <laughs> and, and for me, this is leadership. This is opening yourself up. It's so much easier to talk about our professions and and, and some of the softer issues than it is to say, you know, life's been really tough. I actually have a range of questions that I wanted to have a discussion on, but um, given that time is short, I want to encourage you now to ask questions, and I will take many questions at one time. So can I do the first round of questions? If you have questions or comments you'd like to raise, if you could raise your hand, if you could also self-identify, it would just help us. Thank you. Um, so we have one, oh, sorry, one, two, three, I'm going to take five. One, two, three, any more? Four. We're going to do four at the first round. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I'm Ann Copeland. I would really like to hear from the panel how you overcame, how you dealt with your, like, potentially anger, sadness, when you had massive disruptions, what helped? Okay, great, first question. Second question. Um, hi, I'm Tanvi Gupta. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your story. It's very inspiring. Uh, it's just been so beautiful. Um, my question is, uh, sometimes disruptions, massive disruptions are thrust upon us, like sickness or illness of a child. Sometimes we become disruptors in our own lives, you know, like choosing to go back to work, which is something that I just did a week ago. Uh, and, you know, you constantly fight that struggle. My question is, when you become a disruptor in your own life, then what is it that you tell yourself in terms of that this is the right path to follow? Thank you. 
Question four. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Florence. I, I don't know whether it's an appropriate question, but if you could live your life again, is there any particular one decision or one thing you would have done differently? Okay, I'm going to start with Fermi, and we're going to go... Oh, oh, sorry, five, and then... Four, I can't count. Four, yes, you are four. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Joanna. Um, I've, I have my own business. I'm an entrepreneur, have been for many years. I also have two children, both with chronic illnesses. So a lot of what you're sharing is very personal to me as well. And, you know, without sort of dredging up really bad memories, I would personally like to know if any of you have really felt like you've had your back against the wall and you feel complete despair and then how you've managed to get through that. Sorry, that's a very negative question. No, it's... it's uh, Fermi, do you want to take any... You don't have to qu answer all of them, just answer one of them. Okay. Any one you want, very quickly. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, because it, uh, some are uh, similar. Okay, I do face a very, you know, dark period. I would say it's, it's so desperate. I want to quit. I really want to quit. Um, how I overcome is that, you know, I go back to Jesus. Because I have personal faith, so I go back, because I was always too busy, no time for going to church, and then somehow I will go back. And of course, you know, there are people around me, my husband, and also my, my friends. And sometimes, you know, people don't really understand what I'm doing, but I tell myself, no worry, because there are people out there that they are doing the same thing or a meaningful thing, um, uh, you know, uh, but I will see them as my partner, even though we are doing different things, because, you know, that will be keep myself not so lonely. So I, at that time, because I was the only one social worker working, and then I would say, okay, people are doing some good causes, so not only me, so and maybe I see them as a partner spiritually. So this is, you know, help me, yeah. Pat, did you want to say something? Sorry, you picked up the microphone. Um, well, no, about the personal disruptor thing, maybe. Um, I think that there's more more than actually I don't know I mean maybe you would be in better positions to confirm this but then I think often the the most difficult battles even when you're going through good times or bad times would be your internal struggles and and all the arguments and debates that go in your head and I think that that's what actually Phyllis put it so concisely and brilliantly and I'm like yes when she said that it's about the choice you make. And, and I think this may go to me also go to the back against the wall thing. At every instance, um, what is the overriding thing that you believe in in life, you know? And, and you know, we talked about faith. There's also just your convictions. Um, for me, I am a woman of conviction. I believe in doing good. I believe in taking the next step. I believe in sitting there and evaluating what's going on and what I'm going to do with it. Um, I think that these are the things that I will have to take the time to go, all right, and then decide to move in a positive way. And I think I see that in all, all of you. So choices. Well. Yeah. Conscious choices. Oh. I, I was going to say the the choice is a really big thing. Um, and also, uh, I always tell my girls, I'm a mom of four girls, you have your head and your heart. Sometimes it's good to, to consider your heart before your head. A lot of times it's good to consider your head before your heart, and you've got to have discernment on which one which one to use. Neither one should rule you entirely. Sometimes you have to go with your heart. Sometimes you're thinking. Um, and I think that has gotten me through a lot uh, in saying, okay. And the other thing is being my own best friend. This is the other thing I always told my girls. Be your own best friend because my own messages to myself, I'm very critical of myself, actually. And then I have to say, oh, wait a minute. I can't, I have to be my own best friend. What would my best friend tell me if I said I have this problem? What would they say to me? Would they say, you're stupid? Uh, why did you do that? My best friends would not do that. They would say, no, you know, they would give me encouragement. So, so that's the other thing I always think about. And um, yeah, thank I, you. I think be your own best friend. Fanny. Well, I think, you know, you guys have <laughs> described it really well. Um, maybe, you know, 
for me, yeah, I mean, every day is a struggle, right? And I think just have gracious, you know, have a gracious heart. I think, you know, you've put it. So be forgiving to myself, right? I think we talked about that a little bit, you know, because you always want everything so perfect, but you can't have it all. And so um, it's just pick and choose the priorities, right? Every day is is a new day and then you prioritize, right? Some day it's, you prioritize work and then, um, you know, you don't see the kids for a few days. And then, you know, some days you, you leave work early and spend more days, more time with the kids. So it's really a juggle and, and prioritizing every day. Thank you. Femi. Yeah, it's one thing is, um, because I have been spent more than 20 years to ask why my family is like that. Why me? And then after, you know, um, 20 years <laughs> struggling, asking, and I learned, you know, more, you know, in different way that uh, I don't, I stop asking why me. Sometimes I will ask, you know, why not me? That really, because, you know, who, who am I? Why not me? That the suffering that, you know, why? Okay. Another is that I will also ask, you know, um, the blessing. I count on why me? I will, you know, look into the positive side. If, when I see each time I see every minority suffering, I really will ask, why not me? Why they had to suffer? So I think this kind of questions um, will make me you know, more humble and also is easier. I would say easier to accept you know, our life challenges that you know, um, I, will, I, I kind of you know, thinking that you know, um, suffering may be necessary in our life, but misery is optional. That you know, is quite your attitude and then how you see. Um, I would like to do one more round of questions. Do we have any more questions that are burning at this point? I can take two. No? Um, I'm going to... Yes, one. Another brave person. Um, just as a general... Uh, my name is Elsa Lloyd. Um, just as a general question, um, have you, do you ever spend the time to think about um, your anchors whether you've got people that you can really trust who will um, help you through times of difficulties and have you had times where you felt when you know you're in the valley you know valley of kind of darkness that you don't actually have somebody reliable around you or that you've built it up such a way that you're um, so reliant on yourself that you suddenly realize that your foundations are moving anchors yeah anchors do we have another question over here I, I am so inspired by all of you, but I just want to say, uh, what do you think uh, being a woman has contributed, if at all, to the fact that you, you face these disruptions? Uh, or, or do you think, uh, for example, other, uh, how, how uh, supportive have the men in your lives been for the struggles that you have, that you have been through? Okay, so I'm going to give you each literally a sentence. You can choose to answer the question of trust and anchors. You can choose to answer the question of um, what have men contributed, if anything. They might have caused the disruption. Um, <laughs> um, but but l l let's, uh, who would like to go? Liani, you're holding the mic. Go ahead. Um, One sentence. I think... Um Building a strong support network is important, and you know it, it's 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 your anchor as well too, because you can't do it all, right? And especially as you get bigger responsibilities, it's learning to delegate. So, yeah. Pat. Um. Oh, um. Pass you first. Oh, yeah. Forming, still forming. <laughs> oh, you want me to answer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I want to I wanna, uh, talk about trust. Who do you trust? And I have to say my really good friends were not always the best for me. And so uh, what I have found in looking back, and I was sharing with the girls before, some of the instances that I had of a taxi driver that would say something to me or do something for me or... Um, all, all kinds of unexpected things happen. And always, I always said these two things. Uh, take care of yourself. Take time for yourself, especially if you're feeling really bad. Do things. For me, it's walking. I can walk from Wan Chai to Taiwan. 
if, if I need to work out things in my head. Or when I had all the kids, I took time to play tennis every day. You know, take time for yourself. Uh, and I also learned the other thing. When I'm upset, everybody around me is upset. And that helped a lot. If I cried in front of all my children, they would all cry. If I was sad, all of my children were sad. My helpers would cry if I cried. So I had to learn to, uh, to control that and that people feed off of me. It's not me always feeding off of people and what they say to me, but people feed off of me too. And that helped me set the standard for myself as to how, if I was going to be thankful or happy. And you have to practice those things. They don't come easy. Thank you. Fermi. Sure, just hold on a second. Just hold on. Yes, Fermi. Um, uh, having a soulmate um, is very important to keep myself, you know, uh, moving forward. Or even when I stop, when I, you know, I'm weak, that, you know, someone is around me. So um, for me, my husband is my soulmate because he understands very well about my mission. But for him, his life's disruption is that he has a very workaholic and busy wife. So, so you know, but uh, I think, you know, having a soulmate, maybe not necessarily your husband or a partner, but sometimes you have a good friend that we really we hear to you, listen to you. I think that is important. Pat. Um, one thing I feel like we may not have touched on much is fear and, you know, all the sadness and all of that. Actually, I was thinking those are really positive things as well that really help us to shape and rethink our focus. And it's like part reliance on, on focusing and acknowledging the importance of that as well as how to get out of it. I'm going to, very because I've had the time up about five times now, I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to wrap up with what I've learned. So from Patricia... She is the disruptor herself and needs to find a way, as we all do, of how to deal with it. Liani deals with the struggle of so many working women that why is it that everyone else knows about what my child is doing except me? Why don't I know? Um, why aren't I able to bake cupcakes for tomorrow? Why did I only find out about that three days later? Um, how does my dad play a role? But actually my dad can't replace me. I'm going to go to Fermi. A Fermi, um, incredible discrimination from the minute she set foot in Hong Kong. As, and we never hear, or we rarely hear, certainly in conferences I've been to, from a woman who came from mainland China and became a leader in Hong Kong at the most grassroots of levels, not the head of a massive investment bank. And she worked with the most disadvantaged people and chose to serve them. Yet when she stopped serving them, she fell into depression herself because her life's purpose had changed. And then there was cancer. And then we went to Phyllis. Mm -hmm. And Phyllis started with her story of her health. And I was holding my heart when you started that. I lost my mum just over a year ago. And um, then she talked about her other disruptions and, um, and how she has dealt with all of that. We've had many questions from the floor around trust about how you cope, the role of men. And if I may end with some tips from me. My view is as a woman, probably as a man too, there is no one but yourself. And you don't know when the disruption is coming. I went home on a Friday wanting to pack my bag to be a keynote speaker at Cisco on Monday in Bangalore on women leaders and Zubin died on a Sunday. He did not have a pre-existing condition. I don't have a moment of my life when my child is not with me. We have a legal battle going on that reminds me. I don't know that you can leave some areas of darkness. And I don't know that it's reasonable to expect us to. I think what we can be is loving and caring and nurturing towards others. And if there is one thing I think that women can be good at just because we are women, it is that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in our quest to be that type A man kind of person, we lose that in inherent part of us. And that I think is not being inclusive. 
we've actually excluded a massive part of us. There was a lot of talk about what can help. Antidepressants help. <laughs> Alcohol helps at times. <laughs> Chocolate helps. Shopping. Shopping helps. <laughs> But you know what? When you live in a dark place and only know, you know the darkness that happens in your head, you've got to find your way, your windows of seeing light. Mm -hmm. And that might come through service, but what, the way I do want to end, because one thing that inspired me about all of the, these women, and we didn't talk about it today, was God. I might not be particularly religious, but each and every woman on this panel and at my time as founder of Community Business, my interview with women leaders in Hong Kong, the thing that surprised me more than anything was the importance of God in their lives. I'm not here to try to get anyone to be religious, but I think if we are smart, we need to note it. And maybe we put it in our toolbox. Maybe it helps inform us. Maybe we just live our life in goodness. Thank you to all my panelists. Thank you to you for choosing this.